All right, welcome again to uh, all of our CCC OER members. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And we have kind of a special treat here today with um, Delmar Larson joining us. So big thanks to Delmar Larson, who is the executive director of LibreText. And I think uh, many of you know that uh, LibreText was the recent uh, only recipient of the uh, Department of Education uh, open textbook pilot. And um, so uh, Delmar has a lot of great stuff to tell us about that. Um, about the work they're gonna do with that. All right, everyone can hear me okay, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, and what I'd like to ask is um, if folks wouldn't mind um, just typing in the chat window uh, a little information about who they, uh, about um, where they're from. Um, as, I, as I was mentioning earlier, we have folks from all over the country here, and I just saw some of the New York folks come in as well. So um, this is a, Great opportunity. Um, I was going to say good afternoon for everybody because I think at this point from the Pacific Coast to the East Coast, we're on afternoon time, but I just saw some folks come in from Hawaii. So good morning to the folks from Hawaii. And um, here's our agenda. Uh, basically, we're just going to um, hear from Delmar today, but I, at the end, I'm going to just share with you a few of the events that are coming up in December. Um, I think many of you know about these, but we have a webinar uh, next week, and we have an all-members mixer the week after, and wanted to talk a little bit about Open Ed Week uh, as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Delmar Larson, who is the professor of chemistry at University of California, Davis, and also the LibreText executive director. Josh, uh, well, Delmar? Can you hear me? We can. Uh-huh. Okay. Can I uh, do a screen share? Absolutely. Great. Um, now I need to figure out how to do this. I think this is the right one to do. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, um, proverbially. Uh, and I'm uh, very much uh, enjoying um, the discussions that I've uh, engaged in uh, in the last couple of months since we received uh, this uh, award from the Department of Education, uh, much to the displeasure of my graduate students who don't see me anymore um, uh, and are threatening a coup from my laser laboratory. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let me begin uh, by uh, this. And that went to the wrong screen. So I'll do this. And that also went to the wrong screen. Um, yeah, we're seeing your website. Um, right now, I believe. Oh, it's not. Oh, how did it? It ended. Actually, I don't oh, that, know if it says the world's most popular online textbook platform. Yes, yes. You see that? Uh, it's. Oh, it must have. Uh, it, it shared the actual. Uh, uh, browser window. Browser instead of the output. Do you see it moving right now? Yes, no, you don't. We see your slides now. You see my slides now. Yes. Uh -huh. This is the problem with two screens. Um, let's see what happens if I do this. Do you see presentation mode for my slides? We do, yes. Okay, we're rocking. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, um, how do I begin here? So, the, the LibreText project uh, is a, a relatively mature project in the OER community. It's about 11, 12 years old. Um, first five years of our um, uh, our existence was primarily supported uh, by volunteer work uh, by lots of faculty and even more students. Um, it was initially formed in the chemistry department uh, here at UC Davis, and we called it the Chem Wiki, but it's expanded uh, to a much bigger, more comprehensive scope in the last uh, few years, and certainly uh, in the next uh, few years, it will expand even more. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we have social media that's typically available there that you can access us. Uh, you can Google LibreText, um, and then if you forget our name for some reason or other, just Google any topic in chemistry, and we'll be in the top uh, level uh, of that. So uh, let me uh, begin by actually uh, emphasizing what the LibreText project, or, or more specifically, how it's used on the case there. So. <laughs> um, it's used in different mechanisms by different faculty and student for a variety of reasons. So it's hard to, to say exactly how everybody uses it, uh, but there are 
these modalities out there. Uh, one is used as a curated repository of living content. In fact, it's the largest living content uh, on the net uh, today. Um, and I use the term living quite specifically uh, in the sense that it, it's a content that you can go in and edit it and upgrade it and curate it uh, very conveniently. Uh, the opposite of the living is dead. In that case, there would be something like a series of PDFs, which are particularly painful in order to try to edit. Uh, and then you have something sort of in the middle that are more zombie-like uh, 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 content, which have editing capabilities, but it's a little bit painful in order to be able to process that. Uh, and uh, we can discuss those platforms on the case there. I should mention before I continue on, um, uh, if people want to chime in in order to stop me uh, on anything I say, please do so. Don't wait until the very end uh, because typically people forget, or at least I forget uh, what concerns I have when we're going on. And I like to keep things somewhat informal in my presentations, assuming that that is- So Delmar, uh, do you prefer a chat uh, a chat interruption and uh, it's where's the chat button? There's a chat button somewhere on here. Uh, how do oh, I yeah, look it's at it? It's at the bottom near the share where it should be. Um, pause, annotate, control. Well, let me put it this way I'll monitor the chat window so if anything comes up on the chat, we can do yeah, that. We do that. can also turn on the microphone. Sometimes we get a little feedback, but um, if people want to, they can turn on their microphone. Then I think you're saying to. After. Yeah, yeah, please, please inter okay. interject while I'm actually talking. It makes more sense in order to do this contextually than uh, trying to remember what I said a half hour later. <clears throat> sure. um, uh, uh, so the LibreTex is used as a construction uh, and dissemination platform. Uh, it, we have uh, uh, somewhere in the order of 70,000 pages across all 12 of our existing libraries, and we are planning on expanding that significantly thanks to the Department of Education grant. Um, and it's also used as a usage tool. So it's uh, a mechanism that uh, in part is used uh, in order to assess students' uh, performance, identifying how students engage with activities uh, uh, or their homework. You can identify study habits, and, and, and our goal is to use that information in order to eventually develop a rubric in order to identify how students can better study online. Uh, that's a complicated uh, question um, because there is no one way, I think, on how students can best study. It depends upon their skill set and we need to be able to identify these things uh, in a more nuanced manner than uh, what many people are presenting here. So. I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but let me uh, do this anyways. There are three primary textbook problems that I see out there with the current state of affairs here. One has to do with uh, the, the rising cost of textbooks. I think everyone uh, in this uh, uh, presentation is all on board with that, uh, in addition to the uh, detrimental effects associated with the cost of textbooks. Um, but there are other problems that are a particular concern, especially for uh, institutions where cost is not a primary issue uh, for the students, more affluent uh, student uh, population that is. Uh, the second one is that textbooks can be limiting and not empowering. So we want our textbooks to essentially be a scaffold in order to enable the uh, the curriculum that the department or the faculty member is uh, enacting. Um, but far too often it's used as a crutch, which essentially dictates the curriculum of the class. Um, and that's not meant to necessarily be uh, degrading to faculty because that would be uh, self-deprecating, but it is a, uh, but far too often the faculty select a textbook and the textbook itself it dictates the curriculum. And I feel it's the responsibility of the faculty themselves to dictate the curriculum of the class and, and hone that curriculum them to, uh, to address the needs of the uh, faculty, the needs of the department, and the needs of the students, which uh, no doubt varies from campus to campus. Uh, textbook problem number three is that there's quite a lot of uh, very interesting and very good uh, research in the science of teaching and learning out there on how students learn effectively. Um, uh, but for that research to actually get into the classroom, nowadays it needs to go through the textbook publishers because the textbooks are the de facto gatekeeper in order to hinder uh, social research uh, and uh, put into the, uh, the classroom. Uh, I want to avoid or knock out the textbook as this uh, gatekeeper and provide an opportunity for faculty in order to identify new paradigms, new approaches, uh, and be able to use them effectively in their, in their class. Um, the case there. So these are the three paradigms that uh, are three uh, uh, issues that I have a problem with in the current textbook infrastructure. So um, 
I say this quite often, and I'll say it uh, here, uh, at least in the beginning, is that the textbook of the future is not the textbook of the fa uh, past. So we need to stop thinking about uh, uh, the textbook of the past as a model in order to formulate the future. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so we need to stop thinking, I believe, in building uh, in the OER community individual textbooks and start thinking about building text libraries, uh, uh, interconnected uh, networks of uh, resources out there uh, that uh, demonstrates what we want our students to have when they graduate from uh, college. So we teach in classes, classes are vignettes, we teach uh, subsections in a specific class, and we then go to another class, and there may or may not be any connection off times there's not and that is another entry that goes into the student's brain and then when the students are all said and done we want them to be able to mix what they've done uh, what they've learned in these different vignettes into something that uh, has a synergy that's far greater than the sum of the parts my argument is why are we then giving them uh, textbooks that facilitate these silos give them a text library and facilitate key or what I call a Libra text in order to guide themselves through this library because that's what we want them to think about and then we want to give them the resources in order to go about doing that uh, <clears throat> so what are the Libra text libraries <clears throat> the LibreText libraries currently consist of 12 uh, libraries uh, that are interconnected. And this goes along with what I'm arguing about in terms of uh, building a text library. We want to have these libraries, which are field dependent because we can't get rid of individual fields, uh, uh, obviously, but we want to be able to build something that has this network, that content is uh, being able to go from chemistry to biology and medicine uh, to social sciences and even to humanities, and you can make connections uh, that way, sometimes tenuous and sometimes not, um, and that, uh, that is a guiding principle behind where, what we do. What this means is that while I said that their project uh, was born out of chemistry in the chem wiki, uh, we are far more comprehensive. In fact, we take an approach that I call glibly in my, uh, my team, uh, the no gap left behind approach. So in other words, any uh, field uh, that has a need for OER, which is basically every field and as far as I'm concerned, uh, we are willing in order to address and integrate into our project. Um, chemistry is obviously something that I am, uh, that holds this very special uh, part in my heart, but uh, it's just one of a, a range of libraries that we have available. And we're going to be expanding these libraries as part of the Department of Education grant to include uh, the Career Ed Library, which has uh, been formed uh, and is available uh, for access as of like two or three uh, weeks ago. Which um, library? Sorry, I didn't catch that, Delmar. Which library? Is uh, so, so the, the, this, can you see my mouse? Does my mouse move on your screen? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the it used to be called the Solar Library. We're in the process of revamping that to the Career Ed Library. It's basically CTE um, uh, library. This is part of the requirements for the Department of Education grant. We um, um, we're not fully done with the branding uh, of it uh, and the renaming uh, of it, uh, but uh, that's that's what's. That, that's the point uh, off of that. And that's where our community college consortia members, uh, consortium members uh, will uh, be quite uh, principal uh, in, in constructing it. Uh, in addition to um, the uh, Cal State University system, Jerry Hanley, who runs Merlot and, um, and other uh, entities. Uh, Gills Commons, yeah. Gills yeah, Commons. No, I think the career yeah. technical ed is library is very exciting. We're very excited about that. Uh, it, it's also the, the, the one thing that scares me the most because I have the least familiarity with that field, um, being at our one institution. Um, but fortunately, I have a lot of very talented uh, people uh, in uh, our consortium in order to move that forward. Um, right. um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I should throw this out there, you know, any faculty member that has an interest in order to uh, to be part of our project or take use of our project or contribute to our project, we are uh, open uh, uh, very strongly off of that. So let me mention uh, something briefly about this Department of Education grant that we went through because it, it caused a little bit of um, grief um, and not necessarily grief, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, it was uh, a very interesting uh, situation uh, in, in constructing and uh, getting it uh, because we were fortunate enough in order to, uh, to receive uh, the, the full call of close to $5 million uh, on the case there. Um, so we had f uh, three absolute priorities. Uh, this is in the call of the Department of Education and then um, one competitive priority, which is optional. Uh, one was improving collaborative uh, decision dissemination through consortium uh, arrangements. Uh, so that's why we have a consortium that currently uh, has different levels of commitment ranging from full-blown uh, uh, involvement at the, they're all at the, uh, 
involved at the institutional level. Um, that come in there, but we have other faculty uh, in campuses that where they're only the department, for example, is involved, uh, and they're not a full-blown consortium member uh, as of yet. Um, <clears throat> so the other one is addressing gaps in open textbook marketplace and bringing solutions to scale. Uh, we have several gap analysis uh, sub team members uh, focusing on addressing that um, and promoting degree completion. Uh, and we have several aspects uh, involved uh, in pushing that forward. Uh, uh, and the competitive pr preference priority, if I get to, to that aspect, is essentially uh, capitalizing on our homework infrastructure uh, in order to uh, develop a personalized learning uh, um, system, uh, sort of an AI in order to uh, provide a personal tutor based off of how the students uh, engage with our content and how they work with our online homework system uh, on the system there. So. Um, <clears throat> so the upshot of our proposal. So the LibreText is a community effort, uh, and that's a key point in order to emphasize here. Everyone who can contribute to it meaningfully is uh, is accepted with open arms uh, on the case. They're all are welcome to join. Uh, it, it again is a construction dissemination use uh, platform uh, with, with all that you would expect for those uh, those aspects. Uh, we're using uh, existing technologies, and we're developing new technologies in order to be able to push the overall goal of our project. Um, one of our uh, approaches uh, uh, or one of our flavors uh, is to act as a OER aggregator of sorts where we uh, we will work on harvesting, which is the term that we use, uh, which is basically integrating or borgifying, if you are really big in Star Trek, uh, the existing OER universe into our libraries. And uh, there are reasons for doing that. Um, the primary reason for doing that uh, is it provides a consistent mechanism uh, where all the content has a consistent style and format and, and it facilitates to the maximum capacity the remixing aspect that uh, is important in order to expand OER. And I'll show you an example of that with this OER remixer that we, um, we just went live yesterday. Um, and I keep on harping on this uh, or going back to it, uh, but we'll work with any faculty or campus or OER team in order to move forward. So oftentimes campuses uh, that have OER projects that are just beginning uh, don't have the resources in order to build an IT infrastructure in order to uh, host their content uh, or facilitate the construction of new content. Uh, I argue that there's no reason in order to do that because we'll do that for free. Um, uh, and, uh, and in doing so, you then are able to capitalize on the, uh, the community that we have established, which is growing quite uh, significantly um, in, in order to move forward. So in other words, you don't need to worry about the support support and the infrastructure and the pain of, of, uh, of IT support of whatever platform you happen to do, use, we will do it for you. Um, uh, we have people uh, all over uh, America, um, uh, consortium members uh, at different tiers, um, and uh, we have somewhere in the order of maybe... I think it's uh, 250 million page views uh, that we have collected over the last 11 years. Um, that is equivalent of a close to two thirds of, or four quarters of a, uh, of a millennium of confirmed reading uh, of our content. Um, our team consists of five uh, uh, sub teams. Uh, that have a very specific uh, uh, foci. Um, uh, we have the development team, which I am also the uh, leader of. We have the harvesting team that Kevin Flash at Sacramento City College uh, is driving, and they're they're really pushing uh, both integration of content, but uh, also gap analysis uh, for both their campus and also extends uh, uh, to their district and outside of the district. Uh, Chuck Severance uh, is uh, running our technology team uh, from the University of Michigan. I'm fortunate that he's just downstairs right now in my lab. Um, so we can continue our discussion right after this meeting. Dissemination team is uh, Josh Halpern, um, uh, which is relatively straightforward, involves outreach and a variety of other things. Marco Molinaro uh, is running our assessment and analysis team. Uh, and we have a range of, of faculty and student developers that interact with all the teams uh, independently. Uh, and there's an upper level uh, with me and outreach coordinator, project coordinator. Uh, and we have two advisory boards, one that's industrial, and that's uh, uh, important in order to push the project forward uh, along the CTE line uh, in order to guide us how we're moving. We're hoping that uh, uh, we're able to capitalize on Jerry Hanley's uh, uh, infrastructure down in Cal State in order to be able to make that uh, to the fullest uh, capabilities. And we have an academic advisory board in order to concentrate on the other uh, uh, fields in the system here. This right here is what the LibreText looked like a, um, 
a while ago, um, but what I want to do uh, is somehow use a, is this a website? This is a yep, website. Okay. Website. Uh, so this is the, the front end of my website. Uh, actually, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do this. Um, let me go over this uh, quickly and then I'll go into my website here. So a lot of our effort is focused on uh, integrating uh, or building an online platform uh, rather than offline paper-based uh, OER infrastructure that other people have uh, focused on. Uh, <clears throat> this has certain benefits. One, it has uh, ease of dissemination. So as soon as one member constructs content uh, on the site, then everyone in the world has access to uh, that site. Uh, and that provides an opportunity in order to uh, provide it seamless integration uh, over the multiple fields uh, in each of the libraries and multiple subfields within the, the library. Um, uh, this, by using an online platform, uh, the libraries are largely a wiki-based infrastructure, it facilitates highly collaborative and highly distributive construction efforts, uh, which is particularly important uh, for the community-based construction uh, efforts of the project. Um, we do have a mechanism in order to provide PDF, uh, which is just a very simple button at the upper right hand corner. Uh, uh, we, uh, we do have an online homework system uh, that is going to be in the alpha phase uh, next month. Um, we have three dimensional capabilities where you can uh, uh, provide Basically, I should emphasize here that the things I'm talking about here are focusing around taking advantage of the fact that we have a computer behind the scenes uh, and using it effectively. Again, the textbook of the future is very different from what I believe the textbook of the past is. And you can start to implement uh, new technologies in order to be able to guide the learning experience. And part of that is interactive three-dimensional capabilities uh, for chemistry, for biology in terms of proteins, uh, it, but also for vector calculus in um, in mathematics, which can be used for physics uh, and uh, engineering. Uh, we can introduce multimedia, including videos and simulations. We, in, we can embed FET simulations, we can embed Concord Consortium simulations, and a wide range of other technologies uh, as they come up. Our system is relatively simplified, so we can embed these technologies quite quickly uh, without any overhead complications, which is something uh, that can be a complication or an issue in uh, other platforms. And then once we embed it into one library, then uh, all the users, including faculty and students, uh, in across the whole, um, all 12 of our uh, libraries can then take advantage of that. We have a numerical infrastructure, uh, a calculation infrastructure, uh, Jupyter Notebooks is integrated, so we can have uh, calculations. Uh, scientific calculations embedded into. We have Python, we have R, we have SageMath, we have Octave, we have uh, 25 other languages that are uh, connected to the Jupyter uh, book. So you can imagine that if you're taking a statistics class you know, and you're learning statistics, you can then, as a student, directly interact with the data, do your, uh, your analysis on the data right there on the fly, and then get the results in the case there. And you can do that uh, on your phone because all the calculations are done server-side uh, on our system. We're quite excited about that. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned this before as part of our goals in order to identify how students uh, study better best online. Uh, we can track student uh, performance. We can then do assessment infrastructure off of that, all with appropriate IRB approval if they're part of a, a test case or if they're just meant in order to provide feedback to the faculty member that doesn't require uh, IRB approval. We have several in, uh, integrated annotation uh, infrastructures. We have Hypothesis uh, integrated into our system, uh, and we have Nota Bene from MIT integrated into our system. They both have uh, the capabilities for faculty and student in order to annotate software where it could be or annotate pages and it could be used as a mechanism for students to provide a um, contextual um, uh, help line so they can come in and say I have a problem with this page right here and this, the faculty or the instructor record can go to that uh, and say oh and then address it right there and you can actually then mark up the, uh, uh, the class. This is uh, the front end of our site uh, uh, right now. Uh, let me move this out of my way. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, and I just wanted to uh, show you a bit of those more advanced features uh, that uh, can be used in any of our libraries. Of course, our interactive proteins are not quite so uh, important for the humanities library, but uh, they can be used there. So we can embed um, our, um, our videos. Uh, these are interactive protein with molecules right here. Um, uh, this right here is an interactive three-dimensional Moebius strip because that's what was selected, but there are a range of other um, 
approaches off of there. Jupyter gives you these codes. Like I said, this gives you the opportunity for students to uh, directly type into the code, uh, which is a skill set that we think is important for uh, students today. Uh, and they can run their code, uh, and this takes a moment. There we go. Uh, and then they can, this, is, this provides a, a visual or an animated uh, infrastructure for the data that's given there uh, based off of health and wealth of uh, nations. Uh, uh, I mentioned hypothesis infrastructure. Uh, we can print on demand. Uh, we can print up the full textbook uh, right now. Uh, that's in its beta phase because we can do it, but it clogs up the uh, uh, the external brow the external server that runs that we can import into learning management systems uh, currently via um, common cartridge uh, which we're going to be importing a, a, a bit of courses into the uh, canvas commons uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in the upcoming month or so uh, we're working on OEI compliance uh, uh, which is a com uh, which is a California-based infrastructure with community colleges uh, for accessibility. Um, and that's also supported by the Department of Education. We have a, a component of uh, accessibility in that grant. We have a deep learning management uh, system integration via uh, the SUGI infrastructure, which I might uh, get to um, by the end of my talk, uh, uh, which is meant to be our own learning management system that can then interface to local learning management systems on other campuses via the LTI infrastructure, um, uh, which I believe is learning technology infrastructure, but I'm sure, or interoperability protocols, I'm sure I'm wrong on that, but Chuck Severance, our tech team leader, uh, is the one who wrote that uh, protocol. Uh, so uh, we're able to embed directly into learning management systems uh, comprehensively uh, via deep uh, integration or topically via uh, these uh, uh, common cartridge modules that I mentioned before um, uh, uh, into uh, as modules into learning management systems. We have a homework infrastructure uh, that's uh, in part based off of WebWork, which is a popular math, open source math uh, library system. Uh, the individual that actually built that uh, system, um, uh, uh, Mike Gage is also on our, uh, our team. Um, uh, and, and I mentioned already a significant amount of our effort is in importing uh, open textbooks. We're just completing a, um, an integrator, uh, a converter that will let us uh, integrate EPUBs directly into our system that will make our integration effort about 10 times faster. So we'll be focusing on typesetting and making sure that we have the ability uh, that we want uh, into the system uh, uh, onto it. So. Uh, you had a question in the chat window, Delmar. Um, sure. so, uh, Meredith Moore asked, can you embed into the Blackboard Open LMS? Yes. Uh, the, the common cartridge or the tiny common cartridge infrastructure that uh, that's part of uh, this thing here can embed into any learning management system. Um, uh, we've tested it only with Canvas right now, but we will be testing it with the other learning management system. In other words, because we're, we're satisfying the protocols, it should embed to the other learning management systems. Um, uh, and, and if it doesn't, we will fix it in order to make it uh, uh, work like that. Uh, we will test that out momentarily. Oh, okay. uh, Thank you. Any other questions or is that? Uh, That's the only question I've seen so far. Um, okay. Uh, this should be one five. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> so the libraries, uh, not these advanced features, but the, the core content uh, of the LibreText is stored in our libraries. Uh, and that's a wiki based infrastructure uh, that uh, was forked initially out of uh, MediaWiki, the wiki that uh, the technology that runs uh, um, Wikipedia, but has grown into something significantly more powerful and more flexible by MindTouch, which is a company down in San Diego, um, which is a really great company. Um, and they are constantly updating their software, improving it. Uh, and when they improve their software, then we get to take advantage of those updates and improvements. Um, uh, so we're not a static based system. Um, there are a variety of different ways in which we bring content into our uh, uh, our system. I mentioned harvesting where we take existing OER content and we bring it in. Um, but we've also used uh, students quite extensively over the years. 
Um, uh, and we use students uh, uh, partially in course effort, um, you know, for example, extra credit or forced requirements. Um, uh, we have uh, students that work on effort of integrating existing content for faculty. So if a faculty member is willing to donate their notes, uh, uh, whether they're online or offline, uh, then uh, I hand it off to a student developer and they'll work on integrating it into the system, making sure it has the same format, the same standard. The equations are all math jacks, which uh, uh, gives us LaTeX uh, uh, capabilities of editing it. Because um, again, we want to make it so faculty have the ability to edit anything that they want on the, on the front page. Um, and then we also facilitate the faculty construction of raw content, which is uh, highly supported by our Department of Education grant. Um, the key point here is to make our library uh, as big as possible, and it's the largest living library of OER content on the net today. Um, um, and it's going to get about 10 times bigger very soon uh, on the system here. So the idea uh, is that uh, we, does this actually move? Um, we want to become uh, something like um, uh, the matrix uh, where faculty can come in and construct their content as they need. In this case here, instead of weapons of math destruction, uh, it's weapons of education, uh, where they're looking at various things and deciding what they want in order to, uh, to move forward. Um, so <clears throat> a key to that uh, is the construction of a Libre text, which is essentially a course uh, area, um, which is what Canvas or other things would call off of it. And that has the textbook, but it also has other uh, resources involved in it. And that's formulated by the faculty or the student that's customized for that individual class at that individual term, at the individual campus in the case there. And, and the larger the library is, uh, the easier it is in order to facilitate the construction of a Libre text that's customized on the system there. Um, we have actually two types of textbooks uh, that faculty have access to in order to construct their Libre text. We have textbooks, which are, uh, which are uh, self-contained textbooks that we have integrated into our system. Um, these things, uh, and they should be labeled books instead of maps. For example, the OpenStax textbook would be a book, not a map. This is an older picture here. Uh, <clears throat> but we also have maps, text maps, and that's essentially saying, well, many faculty are uh, hesitant about adopting OER for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, they like their book, for example, and if we could provide them an alternative to their existing commercial textbook, that would facilitate the ad uh, adoption of OER. So what we'll work off of is constructing of a text map, which uses the infrastructure, the organization style, not the text, which would be illegal uh, 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 on the case there, but the, the pedagogy, which has already been shown by the, the um, uh, Supreme Court I don't think it's Supreme Court, but it's already been shown in court case to not be copyrightable, not be uh, patentable, um, uh, and use that as a uh, use that to construct a new textbook using the existing OER content. Uh, that uh, and then you fill in the gaps by using an expert member in order to uh, polish it up on the system. There, um, what that means? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. What, Oh, uh, what that means is that uh, you have access to the existing textbooks, but if you want to grab something, uh, uh, for example, none of these are a text map. These are all textbooks, but uh, in, in um, that even though they say text map, again, I apologize for that. Um, for example, in chemistry, if you want to use the TRO textbook of uh, general chemistry, uh, it's, a, it's a map on our system there. We don't integrate the whole textbook into it. Was there a question before I continue um, I, on? I just wanted to, uh, you know, but maybe ask you to explain because um, you had a, an NSF grant where you created, you started creating these text maps and textbooks, uh, or sorry, text maps yes. um, to help a faculty who were very, in, in, um, you know, <laughs> I was going to say embedded. Um, they were very attached to their textbook that had been written by a commercial yeah, right. you know, mm -hmm. an author and, 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 and so forth. And it was published that way. And so what you did was you took those existing, uh, you know, the table of contents, the et cetera, and you mapped it to um, OER, correct? Yeah, I mapped the OER content to the table of contents uh, and okay. the infrastructure. Yeah, the commercial. 
textbook. Yeah. yeah. I, yes. And I, people probably understood that. I, I think it's worth uh, repeating that though, because um, sometimes that can be helpful uh, for faculty who are really having a hard time making the move to OER. This is one of the most successful things that we've, that I've envisioned in the project. Um, and, and don't ask me about all the unsuccessful things that I envisioned, which uh, were not uh, so popular. Um, uh, but that's exactly right. Uh, for example, in this Brown and LeMay, which is one of the more expensive uh, textbooks, uh, if you go to this book here, here, uh, uh, or this page here, it follows the organization of the Brown and LeMay textbook. Now, which edition, I'm not entirely sure. I should emphasize this is not the Brown and LeMay textbook, which would be illegal for us to do. Uh, but the, uh, the pedagogy and the organization uh, has already been shown legally to be uh, allowed for us to make an, uh, follow the pedagogy of the case there. Uh, and ethical issues, if anyone has a concern about, that many of these textbooks follow other textbooks out there because they're legally allowed to do that. Um, um, and I can, I can give you the court case if you're interested in that. It's actually quite interesting. It was a chemistry uh, textbook that did that in the early 80s. Um, so it, so when they, uh, it means that a faculty member can just quickly adopt this and run uh, uh, with it. Because, uh, uh, you know, I get faculty that join our group, not necessarily because they have a great interest for OER or to have control over it. It's that the bookstore is unable to get them the books until the third week of the quarter. Uh, and they basically come in and they say, help. And I say, well, here it is. Uh, th this is your textbook uh, in order to be, uh, or a text map based off your organization and the system there. But building those text maps are not easy. Uh, they take time. Uh, and sometimes they take more time than we would like. Um, but we're moving forward off of that. So let me show you how, uh, let me show you the, uh-oh. Oh, uh, let me show you the, oh, uh, 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 let me get you one thing. So this is a, a, a the chapter two on here. Uh, and any uh, faculty member or any student uh, it can make a PDF automatically just by pressing this, this down here, like I mentioned to you before. Uh, it spits it out and you can print it up uh, as you want. We can do aggregate uh, uh, batch jobs across the whole textbook. Um, obviously, once it makes a PDF, it's not dynamic because it's a dead uh, component, not a live component, but you can always refresh it uh, and press it again and, and get the live component on the case there uh, on the system there. So, um, uh, so let me go into the remixer. The OER remixer, uh, we're very excited about. Um, and this right here is, uh, so like I mentioned to you, our goal is to take the OER universe of textbooks and bring them into our library but make it so they all have the same format. Um, uh, and I'm quite flexible in terms of that format needs to be tweaked. I'm not dogmatic uh, in, in terms of that, but we want to make a standard in order to make this work. Um, and uh, we, we do some tweaks in order to make it so uh, when we change numbering around of the pages uh, or the sections that they automatically renumber all the equations and the figures and things like that. It goes through a lot of grunt work in order to take this effort in order to, uh, to put it uh, together here. So uh, in order to facilitate that at the student level, because we don't want to uh, do this for every single faculty member, let me phrase that. Some faculty members want to have control over building their Libra text and don't necessarily want us to be involved in it. We're perfectly fine with that. Um, so we built this OER uh, uh, remixer, which we're still in the latter stage of the beta phase and it'll be live probably next week uh, in order to facilitate uh, this thing. So a faculty member can come in and say they want to, uh, they select an area where their college is already set in, uh, designated. This is essentially, they've already have to talk to me in order to make their, uh, their college in our system. Uh, I'm just going to make the remixer test because uh, that way I'm not messing with someone else's uh, uh, college area. And I'm making this, this thing, and I'm going to say this is um, uh, UC Davis, uh, and this is just the format that I tend to use for naming, uh, Cam 101, uh, and I like cats, uh, is the title of the class, so uh, of the, the textbook that I'm making here. So now we have this textbook, and right now it comes up with, the, with uh, uh, 15, uh, off of it, and I just say, well, uh, we start to build this after we've I have an identify after we've identified what resources we want in what order. Um, uh, so let's say that we have this map, and we know that we have access to. Um, Let's say I'm making a general chemistry class that I like cats as a general chemistry class. So we have a range of different books and maps uh, uh, on the case there. And I want the first book to be, uh, I'm going to call it, I like cats. 
Okay. And then all I need to do is say, okay, I really want, let's say, OpenStax content, uh, and I want measurements to be the first section of that. Uh, where is that? Uh, where? I didn't. Did move it down there? Okay. Um, and then it makes a section down here, and then I want this one to be here, and then I want, uh, I especially feel that it, I should be grabbing something from Chem Prime instead, and I want to grab this one right here, um, uh, and, you know, Coulomb's Law uh, or, or so. Uh, and it automatically sets this thing up. Oh, and I've I moved it outside, so. And then the next chapter is, I really like cats. Uh, and I do the same thing uh, off of this, or I can grab this whole chapter, uh, and now this whole chapter comes in here, and let's say I want everything that comes off of that. Uh, and they start building it, and they start getting into, uh, did I tell you I like cats? By the way, I don't like cats. Um, uh, and it automatically sets up so you could facilitate this rapid remixing of the OER universe, at least the OER universe that's in our library, which is going to be very expansive very soon, already is significantly bigger than any other chemistry resources out there. Uh, and we've constructed these things and you can do whatever you want, like deleting them, changing them around uh, and such. Uh, and I'm going to just delete these things. We still have a few more things off of that. And let's say that I really like this textbook uh, as constructed which is kind of crude uh, right now, uh, and I publish it. And lo and behold, it takes a, a moment in order to cycle through each of the pages in order to copy it into my area, which is the remixer text area. Uh, and that's how we can remix content. This is currently set up in order to handle the li content in the chemistry library or any of the other libraries that we have. Anyone can play with it. You guys can play with it right now. You just can't publish a Libra text because you probably don't have an account on our library because we want to preserve fidelity on the system. I give an account to any faculty member or any OER developer or a curriculum developer that wants to be able to do that. Fine, it actually does that. We click this open, uh, and this is the textbook that's created, uh, and lo and behold, uh, we have a, a chapter here that has all these sections up uh, of various content uh, that's out there. Um, um, now, so we had a question from Amy yes. as well. She said, is there sentence level editing? Yes, that's what I'm going to be showing you right now. Oh, okay. uh, so this right here is topical level editing, which is able, which is meant in order to handle, you know, what percentage that it's able to handle an individual faculty's needs depends upon how close uh, the content that we have fits that person's needs. So some people it's 100%, okay, uh, and then they don't want to edit it, okay. So uh, before answering that question, uh, I need to uh, discuss that there are two types of uh, content uh, on our system. There's source content and there's transcluded content. Transcluded content, if you are familiar with Linux, is like a symbolic link. It basically means that the content is really not on this page. So any page that we have, we have the ability to edit the page if you have an editing account. So when you edit the page, you normally see content to edit. But in this page, it doesn't see anything. It just has one line that says path, uh, uh, page path to reuse. Basically, it says that the content is really somewhere else, and it's just stored here. Now, why do we do that? Well, uh, we have a guiding principle uh, that we want to limit the amount of forks that are necessary, that are there, so that when we upgrade our core material in the resources, that everyone can take advantage of that in their overall aspects. Now, there are people that then don't want to necessarily use our core material. They want to fork it, remix it on the case, which is perfectly fine. That's the whole power of our system there. But the point is that when you start remixing it, you can't have it coupled to the same content that it originally came from mm -hmm. because they're forked. Uh, it, they just don't work off it. So you have to, if you want to edit content in the way I had it set up there, you have to go to the original content. And then when you edit that, you then have a full editing capability that has a GUI interface in order to be able to set things up uh, on the case there. If you particularly like editing HTML, which no one should, um, uh, you can look at the HTML backend uh, on the system there. Uh, but uh, it has a front end that is a uh, uh, GUI interface. I'm gonna get rid of that because that's old. Uh, uh, that people can come in, they can edit equations right here via our LaTeX, 
uh, which unfortunately they'd have to learn in order to edit equations. They can embed a video. They can they could do things like I don't like this paragraph and delete that and save it. I'm not going to save it. Actually, I will save it. Okay, so now I've interfered with this core material, uh, chem prime. Okay, but. Uh, key point is that because this is a wiki, it saves all revisions. Uh, so I can go back and I can uh, revert to a previous revision. Um, as soon as I find the revert button, there it is. Hmm. Um, uh, and then it goes back. So this is important uh, in order to uh, make sure that people don't consider our platform as sort of fragile. I, I argue that people should get in there and feel comfortable getting gritty and dirty. I prefer them to do it in their sandbox rather than going out and learning it on the, the core material, but they have the ability in order to do that. Um, we think this is going to be great. We're going to expand this again to all the libraries. So if you're in the chemistry, you can then go in and pull in physics or geology or such into this content and do the same remixing and editing. I should mention here that while this brings over content uh, into the, where are we? Uh, it, into the LibreText. Uh, if we want to fork it, uh, we just need to bring the content. I didn't uh, go here. So this right here is transcluded, like I mentioned to you. It's copied from the core material. But if you want to, you could just basically go to the core material and paste it into here. Um, like let's say this one's still kind of uh, pulling up revisions uh, and such. Sometimes that can take a while because of the size of our database. Uh, this one here is core material uh, and you have the ability to, to copy and uh, paste. I just copied and pasted it uh, like you would. Uh, and lo and behold, it's, it's now formally forked. So anytime I edit, edit here, it does not affect the content master material in the, the bookshelves. Um, and that gives you your custom. We're going to make a little button that will make a little that you just press. It'll convert from transcluded to copy. So you don't need to do that sort of grunt work that I just talked about. Uh, again, the, the point is to make it convenient for um, for faculty uh, and uh, course developers in order to manage things without having to uh, uh, to really deal with the grunt work unless they have to deal with the grunt work, like forking, not forking, but but editing and customizing the content in the system. There, you don't want to have to make them deal with the grunt work. I totally get that. So um, this has been great, Delmar. It's about quarter of, and I thought maybe we should open this up to questions okay. um, on a more formal basis, if, if you're okay, because you've, you've kind of gone down into some very um, low level stuff, which is important to know. And the, the GUI drag and drop interface yeah. looks, looks great. If you, if, you, if you can give me one minute uh, to do two slides and then I'll end, that sure, would be great. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, how do we construct a, a, a textbooks? There's a complicated manner that, that looks like this, which involves basically tapping into all the infrastructure, which I don't want to go into. The simplified manner looks like this, which is uh, it, when, uh, when we want to adopt a textbook or build a textbook, a Libre text that is for an individual class, the biggest problem the faculty member has is essentially identifying what they want. Um, because many times faculty members are not used to having complete freedom in order to uh, to control their curriculum uh, on the case there. Uh, so once the faculty member identifies what they want, then they ask a question, does something exist in the, li the libraries or the bookshelves uh, today? If something already exists that is, is essentially identical to what they want, we copy and paste it and it's ready to go. Okay, But most of the time they want to customize it in some way or the other. So what we do is we copy it, um, paste it, uh, and then the uh, faculty or the students that are part of the faculty team or so starts editing it in order to satisfy what they want and then they go. This is all within their sand box or their uh, campus based system. But what happens if there's uh, if the, we don't have anything on our site that resembles what they, they want, which is oftentimes the case, but it's getting better and better. Then we ask the question, does something exist outside of our libraries, uh, our platform uh, that is already available? If yes, then we work on integrating it into our system using our harvesting uh, team, largely based off of undergraduate support because they uh, are graduate, undergraduate students because they have a very good return on investment for that. Um, or we ask permission in order to integrate into our system. If we do, we, we 
harvest it. If not, then we're stuck at this low level, which is constructing things from scratch. Uh, and that's where the cooperativity or the community constructed effort uh, uh, is critical in order to be able to move things forward. Uh, and we have a variety of uh, uh, projects uh, in this level right now that involves supporting students and faculty and multiple campuses in order to do that. Um, and many other uh, projects also have similar uh, infrastructures in order to move forward off of that thing. Okay, with that, uh, uh, I, I can end without giving you more details and, uh, and such and uh, can answer yeah. any questions. Well, I, I, yeah, Dubner, because I think, you know, uh, this has been a great overview. I'm going to guess that, um, you know, some of our members out here would like to know about how they would engage. Let's say, uh, What's the process for a college to engage in being part of the Libra Text um, group? Um, and, then, and then later, what's the process for just an individual faculty to get on the platform? Um, or, do, or, or do you engage directly? Do you want to engage with the college first? And then all the faculty then obviously would have um, an opportunity. Um, yes and yes. Uh, so right now our team is sufficiently developed in order to facilitate, uh, and we do this quite often at the individual faculty level, um, which is important. And again, the philosophy is that when we build something for one faculty member at one campus, uh, it is no doubt going to be useful to another faculty member at another campus, uh, in the case there. Um, uh, and in some cases, we even assign an undergraduate uh, uh, student developer in order to uh, uh, to a faculty member in order to aid in the construction of content. At the institutional level, um, there are, uh, you're basically talking about what happens when they want to be a consortium member. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and to be a consortium member, the uh, it's still less defined about what's required in order to be a, a consortium member and that's intentional uh, because all I want to do is to see some buy-in from the campus in, in OER uh, Libre text effort uh, and that can range from a variety of different things so obviously the faculty member the institution can provide some support for us in order to move forward uh, and support can be used effectively um, financial that is um, but that's not uh, that's not the the way that I would prefer campuses in order to do that. I'd like campuses in order to invest their resources into their own faculty uh, and teams in order to construct and adopt and customize content uh, via, for example, the stipends, uh, course releases, or things like that uh, in order to basically demonstrate that they have skin in the game in order to move forward. Um, okay, so it looks uh, like in kind a kind of uh, support is also an option for consortium members. So how would they contact you or the team? Is there, I know that last time we talked, you were looking at adding some additional interfaces besides the main uh, info at libratex.org. Um, contacting me directly at info. I mean, I info goes to several different people. Um, so if you contact me, then we can direct it. Uh, most of the time, it requires some level of discussion in order to find out exactly what people want because these things are so uh, variable across different campuses with different goals and different resources and uh, and such. I, I've had a, a community college contact me and basically said that they wanted to drive out all textbooks in their by the president of the community college, they want to drive out all textbooks in their uh, on their campus uh, and hang a gone fishing sign outside the bookstore, which I thought was cute. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope they've talked to the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> I did not ask him about that, uh, uh, you know, but nonetheless, uh, um, it, you know, if. Uh, Contacting us directly is the, is the best way of doing it. So we're not so enamored, uh, so inundated with requests that uh, that doesn't that things fall off to the, the wayside. Uh, we are willing to work with anybody. In fact, you can argue we're paid now by the Department of Education to work with everybody in order to make this work. So, uh, and so to get an we'll account on LibreText to actually get an account to start creating your own um, uh, textbooks of sort, uh, your own, mm -hmm. uh, we would go through info. Yeah, just send me an email directly there or, or, or directly to my UC Davis account. Both of them uh, will work. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, that's going to be uh, delegated to another uh, 
team member in order to handle those things. Uh, but for now, talking to me directly, and then we can uh, have a, a, a more detailed discussion about what the goals are uh, of the individual faculty or OER team uh, in order to move forward. And if the OER team um, is uh, interested in having more control over that section, we can give them administrative capabilities so they can actually make um, uh, accounts themselves um, on the case there. We just have to try to uh, maintain some control over it in order to ensure fidelity uh, in our content. Um, we had an issue a few uh, years ago with people storing Bollywood films uh, uh, on our uh, site when it was open. Interesting. So, um, for your content developers, that that content is peer reviewed within specific fields or disciplines. Yeah, so we have uh, curators for our libraries. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, but obviously, no one curator is able to curate a whole library with all its subfields and such. Um, so uh, uh, we rely on the internal peer review, but we also rely on external peer review. Um, so we don't have a review infrastructure like what Open Textbook, textbook Network uh, has, for example, um, although we're intending on uh, coupling with Merlot in order to be able to do that. Um, the uh, uh, And reviews can be useful uh, as a mechanism for peer review, but one of my uh, primary uh, problems with peer review is that they oftentimes don't have an expiration date uh, and when you're dealing with content that's dynamic those peer reviews start to go out of date and then they become detrimental to uh, the evaluation of the uh, the content um, they're perfectly fine in the old-fashioned way where uh, you know you you represented textbooks based off of editions and you know the edition and, and then that's about it um, uh, second uh, because our content there's lots of eyeballs on it. Um, like I said, with approximately one year of confirmed reading happens per day uh, on our site. Uh, it, it provides a mechanism for, uh, uh, this is gross uh, review where students and faculty uh, who look at the content can then email us directly or provide feedback, which is available at the bottom of the page if they have an account. Um, uh, not even an editing account, a non-editing account provides that. Uh, and then they can provide feedback that comes back to us and says, this is pro this is wrong, I don't agree with this, this is confusing. And then we hand that off to the, uh, the author of the content uh, or we fix it ourselves if we're unable to do it directly um, or hand it off to the curators in order to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. We've had a couple of other questions. Um, one is, are you integrating materials from OER Commons as well? Yeah, um, like I said, when I, when I say the term OER universe, I truly mean uh, everything that's OER, uh, we're gonna be bringing into our system. So um, we have the OER, uh, we have the list of resources in, in OER Commons and Open Textbook Network. Um, and uh, we are slowed down for that because we're trying to build a library, our student developers, we're scaling up to about um, 100 student developers that we expect when we go through this effort. Um, and we want the technology so we can um, just integrate EPUBs directly, which will save us a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. We had another question as well about, are there any online tutorials to assist faculty or, or others, I assume, who are in navigating and editing in the platform? That's a great question, uh, and the question is maybe. Um, the, the, um, uh, we have some things uh, that are in play, um, but we're going to be building uh, some YouTube videos um, in order to really guide uh, that. Um, uh, and, uh, and we do have a best practices document, uh, which is able to give a basic principles uh, of, of how things go. Um, it, it, but there'll be more out there very soon. Um, uh, I just have, I'm trying to find uh, one of my team members that has a good voice because I, I really hate listening to my voice on computers because uh, I think it's awful. Um, so I think it needs to be a nice uh, um, uh, Morgan Freeman based voice in order to uh, present uh, the tutorials online. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's a good voice is always helpful for things like that. Um, yeah, so I guess if somebody was interested in moving from an existing platform to LibreText, have you thought about that? Because I mean, there's folks who are using OER hubs, there's folks that are using, um, let's say the Lumen Learning Platform. 
um, if they wanted to move to LibreText, have you thought about um, you know what the transition kind of picture would look like? Um, the unfortunate thing is that every platform has its own um, issues uh, and, and styles off of it. Um, <clears throat> so many of the times it requires a gr a brute force. So if a faculty member is willing to uh, uh, to switch platforms, and we have had you know about a dozen or so of those faculty, uh, we typically uh, have to do it on an individual basis in order to evaluate what's necessary to bring it over. Uh, some things are easy and some things are, are hard. Um, so for example, if it's relatively simple HTML interfa interface uh, and content, which both of those uh, platforms are, are are, uh, we have the ability in order to just hand it off to one of my student developers uh, and then they just copy it over uh, uh, in order to make it work. And uh, you know, part of our harvesting the, the universe in, in, entails at least integrating Lumen's um, uh, public library. Uh, um, and I don't know about their more private or customized content. Um, we've had people from uh, come over from OpenStax when they used to have a uh, a platform for customization and people from CK12, which I'm more familiar with. Um, I haven't had anyone come over from ChemHub that I'm that I know of, but I would have to go check around to see if someone has done that. Okay, thank you. Um, it's just about on the hour, so uh, are there other questions? People can turn on their microphones as well now if you'd like to jump in and ask Delmar any questions. I think uh, um, we've gotten um, some great information here and. Uh, Delmar, can we share these slides with um, folks as well? Is that yes, um, most of them are internal, so don't, but some of them are probably not uh, Creative Commons licensed. Um, so don't slab a uh, Creative Commons license on it, please. Oh, okay. Like, like this one, uh, for yeah. example. <laughs> uh, unless you want me to cut up all the stuff that uh, is not, uh, it doesn't fall into it. Um, um, yeah, well, you know, um, we'd be happy probably to remove a few things. Um, so, okay, well, g yeah. give me a day and, and I'll get back to you with uh, yeah. a cut up version yeah. of it. Okay, that's super. Thank you. Um, mm. All right. Um, so we're still uh, open here for other questions for um, Delmar. And a uh, big thank you to um, Delmar for coming to join us today. And I, I, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of interest as this rolls out um, in more detail. Um, and just very briefly, um, I'm mentioning that next week we have, um, I'm sorry, it's, yes, it is next week, the impact of OER adoption on cost outcomes and st stakeholder perceptions. This is with a couple of the Open Education Group fellows, uh, Regina Gong, I think many of you know, she's on my executive council from Lansing Community College, and David Rose, and they're talking about uh, the research they've been doing um, at their institutions. Uh, our new member mixer is December 12th. This is targeted at everyone. And we hope that you can join us for this, uh, especially new members, because we're gonna give you a chance to introduce yourself. Um, the topic is gonna to be becoming a change agent and also submitting you, your OER questions for 2019. We'll have a panel of experts who will be answering those. So uh, do join us if you can that day. Open Ed Week's coming up. I think many of you have uh, saw this. Uh, the site launched, um, I think it was the week before Thanksgiving. So this is an exciting opportunity to uh, bring open ed awareness to your campus. Um, there'll be a lot of special events during that week as well. And we love when you share the projects with us so that we can uh, display those worldwide. <laughs> so uh, D Delmar, I don't know if you're still here, but um, they, uh, Annie Fox from, um, from Front Range, Colorado said that your voice is fine for training, just FYI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we released our new member toolkit um, last week, and um, we hope that this is helpful for those of you who are new to the Community College Consortium for OER or if you have new faculty, new instructional designers, librarians who are coming in and want to know how to participate in the community. Um, and we're very open to feedback on that. And that's all I had. So uh, once again, I want a big thank you to Delmar for joining us today. Um, and if we'll, we'll be, we'll publish the um, recording and the slides when, when those are available. And, um, I think you can contact Delmar directly um, or you can ask me questions if you, if you want to do any further follow-up.
So yes, thanks uh, for, yeah. thank you. All right, well, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Una. You're welcome.